Good evening to all of you. We're very, very glad that you're here. If you will, take a Bible, open it with me to the very end of the Bible. Last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 2. That is where we are going to be this evening. We're very thankful that you are here. Hopefully you got a copy of the material if you had not already. Earlier in the week or last week, we are on lesson number 6 of our Wednesday evening Bible study here in the auditorium. We're studying the book of Revelation, and we are in Revelation chapter 2. We've laid a good amount of groundwork. Last Wednesday, we were in Revelation 1. We've been doing our best, even on Sundays, uh, especially this past Sunday morning, trying to make a lot of this personal and practical for us today. This evening, we want to go back and study in detail this communication to the church in Ephesus, Revelation 2, beginning in verse 1. We're glad that you are here. We'll get into our study in just a moment. Of course, we want to begin with a word of prayer. And so if you will bow with me, let's pray together. Our great Father who is in heaven, we give you all honor and glory and praise. We thank you for this opportunity to call out to you together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and to know that you hear us, you know us, each one of us individually, you know this church, you know our efforts and our toil, and we humble ourselves before you this evening as the great I am. We ask your blessing on us as we open up your word and study from it. We thank you for all who are able to join us and who are studying and and teaching throughout this building this evening. We pray that this time would be used in all age groups to help us grow in our love for you, in our determination to walk with you, and to glorify you in the way that we live. We thank you for preserving this incredible revelation. We pray that our hearts would be open as we study, we pray that we would grow individually and, and as a church, help us to remain sensitive and dedicated to our first love. Help us to be humble and reverent as we study the example of these real life men and women and may it provoke us to greater works and greater affection for you. We pray that we would use this time as a refreshment that you would walk with us as we leave this place and throughout the rest of this week. It's in the name of your risen Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Revelation 2 is where we are going to be, if you have not already turned back there. Remember last Wednesday evening, we studied Revelation chapter 1, and we heard the instructions of the glorified Christ to John. We've talked a lot about the background of all of this, and now we are studying in detail uh, the, the text. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, we read along as John says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. The instruction is write, and to write to these particular churches, and that is where we are going. Here is the island of Patmos. We showed some pictures of that last Wednesday evening. Here is where John is, uh, out toward uh, the Aegean Sea, north of the Mediterranean Sea. This is the western edge of modern-day Turkey. Here is where John is, and here are those churches in red to whom John has been told to write. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20, that's where we ended last Wednesday evening, uh, the, the explanation of some of these incredible things that John had been shown, the very last verse of Revelation 1, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, this is the, the glorified Christ 
speaking as for those seven stars in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so here is this glorified son of God standing in the midst of these lampstands which represent the different churches to whom John is going to be writing. The first one, as we read in Revelation 1 and as Revelation 2 begins, John writes from the Isle of Patmos to this church in Ephesus. You might keep a marker there in Revelation 2. We'll get into that text in a few moments and open a Bible with me back to Acts chapter 18. Let me ask you, when you think of the church in Ephesus, what do you think of? Anything come to mind? We'll read what Jesus says to the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 in just a moment. But of course, that is not the first time that we read about saints in the city of Ephesus. And so when you read that, what do you think of? The church in Ephesus. Alan, go ahead. It's a great temple there. Okay. And we're following in the 19th chapter. <laughs> this was a thoroughly pagan city, right? Lots of temples to gods and goddesses, and we'll notice a particular goddess in, in just a couple of moments. Other things, when you think of Ephesus, what do you think of? Ephesus pops up a lot in the text. Okay. And it seems like a church that, like all churches, had struggled, but it seems to be very active, particularly in the early years of Christianity. Okay. There's a lot going on. Uh, among saints in Ephesus, and we'll get a, a little sampling of that as we move along. Anything else stand out to you, Paul? Go ahead. Hey, this is a, it, was a, it was a high society type of an area. Okay. They were rich and, and, and everything, and an excellent place to begin a church sure. because of the amount of paganism and, and all the uh, high society type sure. stuff that goes on. Lots of people exactly. there and a big city. In the ancient world, Greg, when you think of Ephesus, what do you think of? Uh, I think of the riot that was caused because of Christianity coming in. And All right. Lifting with the, the uh, ones making the silver. Okay. We don't have the time to read everything, but I want to hit some high points with you. You've got your Bibles open to Acts chapter 18. You look down at verse 18. Acts 18, verse 18, this is at the very end of what we refer to as Paul's second missionary journey. After this, after being in Corinth, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila. We know that those two, that husband and wife, meant a great deal to Paul. At Sincrea, Paul had his uh, hair, he, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. And they, presumably speaking of Paul and, and Priscilla and Aquila, they came to Ephesus and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. Down in verse 24 is where we are introduced to that man who is mighty in the scriptures, Apollos. He comes to Ephesus. And of course, Priscilla and Aquila are still there. It is in Ephesus that they take him aside and explain to him the way of God more accurately. But we get the idea that Priscilla and Aquila, of course, they are dedicated disciples of Christ. Perhaps they are uh, responsible for the earliest seeds of Christianity in this great city. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 1, now at the beginning of his third missionary journey, Paul comes back to Ephesus. And it is there in the first few verses of Acts 19, he finds those 12 men who know only about the baptism of John. And so he fully informs them about what Jesus had accomplished. And they are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul lays his hands on them and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Down in verse 8, notice especially when we think about how this church came to be. Acts 19 and verse 8, he, speaking of Paul, entered the synagogue 
and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them. Who would be the them in Acts chapter 19 that he is reasoning with? Those would be Jews, right? These are Jews who live in the city of Ephesus. We've noted in other contexts how this would be almost universally Paul's first step. If there is a Jewish synagogue, go there first. And as long as people are willing to listen and reason and, and explore from the Old Testament scriptures about the coming of the Christ, Paul will do that. He's trying to persuade them about the kingdom of God. But, verse 9, when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him. Already we see there are disciples of Jesus in Ephesus, and he reasons daily in the hall of Tyrannus. Luke tells us in verse 10, this continued for two years. And so Paul comes over to Ephesus at the end of his second missionary journey, but he doesn't tarry long. He comes back and he stays in that city for two years. It's not often that we find him staying in one location for such a long period of time, but he does that. Two whole years. In verse 11, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul in this city. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Imagine seeing that sort of thing and knowing that this man is in your own city. But of course, as has already been mentioned, there is eventually a riot. Paul has been here for so long and is so powerful in what he is doing that is causing a serious threat to the idol manufacturing trade. And so there is this man, Demetrius, that stands up and says, listen, we've got to do something about this. They gather together basically a, a riot, a rabble of people is the way that Luke describes them. And essentially the entire city is turned uh, upside down where for about two hours there is this cry heard all over the city. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Eventually Paul is going to leave Ephesus. After two years he travels back across the Aegean Sea back over to Greece, and on his way now toward Jerusalem. He wants to get to Jerusalem before the day of Pentecost. You look with me at Acts chapter 20, finally. Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. On his way back from Greece toward Jerusalem, he and his companions stop here along the coast at Miletus. And he sends north a few miles to Ephesus, it is the Ephesian elders, elders of the church in Ephesus, who come down and they meet him in Miletus. And he's got that long discourse in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 18. How he describes how he had spent those two years among them and how he had occupied his time and the good that had been done. But he also has a warning that among your own selves, there are going to be those who rise up and lead people away from the faith. He charges them to watch over the flock faithfully, among which the Holy Spirit had made them overseers. And then he leaves. Remember, they have this uh, heart-touching scene on the beach where they, they weep together because they know that they're not going to see him again. Now, briefly go back with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, when we think of the church in Ephesus, of course, we ought to think of this letter. A letter that Paul eventually writes from Rome. He is under house arrest and he writes back to these brethren among whom he had spent about two years. And you notice how that begins in Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
And he'll spend what we have as uh, the next six chapters talking about these incredible blessings that are available because of the work of God and the Christ and the Holy Spirit of God. We could continue on. We could read in Timothy how Paul has left Timothy in Ephesus. Uh, we learn in Ephesians and in 2 Timothy that another companion, Tychicus, has been sent by Paul to Ephesus. It is very clear that these brethren mean a great deal to that man. And we've got indicators of strength, right, and, and, and maturity and the progress of the gospel in this very metropolitan city. Now, at the end of the first century AD, we go back to Revelation chapter 2. It has been several decades since Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians, and this is what the glorified Christ says to them. Think about this, that, that perhaps another whole generation or two generations have come along from those original ones who heard the good news, perhaps first from Priscilla and Aquila in the book of Acts. Now the glorified Christ says, this is the first church, John, that I want you to write to. And this is what he says. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. And let's just read the whole thing, and then we'll come back and dissect it a little. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. And how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers... I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The very first question that we asked at the top of our material, we're going to see it seven different times. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, Smyrna, Smyrna and, and Pergamum, and, and so on and so forth. What should we make of that? We, we saw in Revelation chapter 1 this awesome, glorified Son of God who has seven stars in his right hand. And those are described as the angels of the churches. And now each one of those he begins with to the angel of the church in... What do you think? What's going on there? Mark, go ahead. Um, so, so this is um, repeating the this is a sense of, of holiness. Okay. But he's, he's applying these letters and stars and this, this communication with everybody. And we're all inclusive, but it also gets an impact. Okay. If he um, goes to the oh. results of that line, he's showing this intimate connection, this is the knowledge. Okay, we'll talk about numbers that continue to show up a couple of different times. We'll, we'll especially talk about that in a couple of chapters, having noticed this number seven several different times. Keep that in the back of your mind. You brought up this idea of intimate knowledge of each one of these churches. David, what do you think of when you read this? Well, <coughs> Yeah, Jesus is reigning, so he's, he hasn't left us here alone. Okay. His angels are messengers 
And so this letter is being written to an angel that is his messenger. Okay. And has a responsibility for, you know, making sure the message gets out to the church. Okay. And so even today, I mean, the application today is there's angels okay. involved in, you know, the work that we do. We've been studying the book of Hebrews here recently on Sunday mornings, perhaps one of the clearest indicators of the way that we as Christians should think of angels came in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 where the writer asks, are they not all, speaking of angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? They are sent by the one who is sovereign in ultimate authority and they are sent for a purpose, right? To accomplish whatever it is that he determines. Alex and then Alan, go ahead. Okay. Like okay. Some of the ideas that we're not alone. Okay. But I think a lot of Christians can very be mixed stuck in the rut of thinking, well, miracles have ceased today. We're no longer seeing divine intervention of God. But nowhere do we see that. We, oh, the only thing that's ceasing is human uh, catalyzed miracles of human. Okay. There's no indicator saying that angels stop serving. There's no indication that God is still not intervening. That He just changed the way He did. Okay. We we have the complete revelation of God. We don't have like we read in Acts chapter 19, uh, an apostle laying hands on someone and imparting miraculous spiritual gifts. But as you brought up this idea that of course God is still on the throne and able to accomplish. Whatever it is that he needs to accomplish, Alan, go ahead. Uh, the, the emphasis of church is, I think, is typical of a modern day church. We're going to notice several similarities, of course, uh, as we go through. These are not ancient problems with outdated solutions, right? People are people. No matter where they live and when they live, we, we've tried to draw that out the last couple Sunday mornings. So there's a lot we can learn from. We're talking about the things that were wrong with the church at Ephesus. Mm -hmm. Yet though they exceeded at the first. On the 28th, chapter, 28th verse of the 20th chapter, of that, he said, Pay careful attention to yourself and to all the flock, and which the Holy Spirit has made you holy to you to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know after my departure, spirit of came in among you, not sparing flock. Now something happened, and never, never, the, the, the people you say, and no, no teens, or what are they called? Nicolaitans. Uh, Christ had a problem with us. Mm -hmm. We'll talk so about that, that in just a moment. That has caused some things to happen in that church. And they fell away. Good start, just like a lot of churches throughout the New Testament, right? But also a fair share of problems. Problems that we can go back and hopefully learn from, right? Paul, go ahead. Yeah, we've been talking before about Daniel and the correlation between Daniel and Revelation. Mm -hmm. And we can see the amount of work that was done from the Almighty through the use of angels back then right. and how it's transformed all the way until this time now. Well, we can see, and we'll be getting to it later with Brother Craig, in Hebrews chapter 13, it, it says, let brotherly love continue, that we may be entertaining strangers unawares this very day. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that I think we limit the power of the Almighty when we say, well, there ain't no more angels. When the scriptures tell us that there's angels on that we're unaware of. Sure. We're going to see yeah. millions upon millions of angels in just a couple of chapters. And in the book of someone Revelation. has to do that work directly. They didn't have the scriptures we do today. Yeah. They need someone to help them with that work constantly. Yeah. Ruby, go ahead. It's kind of uh, hard to realize the spiritualness of these angels, the message. This isn't just the one thing. It's the whole word of God that has right. been, had that is in the church saying, No, it's there. Are you obeying this wonderful message that you have? 
that was delivered to you. Right. In that whole complex of the spirit of this angel. Plenty that we don't know, right? We're even this evening pushing up against the, the, the limits of what God has revealed and kind of groping in the dark. But remember, even in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul kind of pulls the curtain back for a moment and, and gives us the idea that we're not wrestling as Christians against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And just as there are spiritual forces of evil, there are also spiritual forces of good. We got a, a wonderful glimpse of that, more than a glimpse, in, in the book of Daniel, and we'll continue to get glimpses in Revelation. Andrew, go ahead. This is... Um... This is very weird. I've got two observations that I think are relevant to the conversation I had. The first is that he addresses it. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars. The very verse before this is where he says the seven stars are the angels of the church. So to the angel of the church, these are the words who holds the angel of the church. Mm -hmm. So I am the one who is commanding of you. Or we could look at it to the angel of the church right. And then from that point on, this is the message that the messenger is carrying. Right. And I think both both approaches would work. And when we read the letter itself, it's not a letter to the angel. It's a letter to the church. He's a messenger. Right. right. What's, what's neat about that, though, is that it doesn't say, give this to the angel to carry. And it's, it's John who's delivering this message. It's to the angel of the church, right? So right to the angel of the church. What you just mentioned about there's good, there's spiritual beings, there's... Okay, so the church that's meeting in Ephesus, this is a body of believers, they get together and there is a spiritual being who is with them. There is a spiritual being who... I can't even describe what it is, but associated with that body of believers. There's millions of angels. There's an abundance of angels. There's plenty of angels. So if that body was not there, would that angel be doing something different? Maybe. Is there an angel with us when we come together? Is our spiritual entity something that is communed to heaven through a messenger? I, I don't know. That's yeah. what I'm saying. This is kind of a, a very weird statement that he doesn't say, deliver this message. He says... To the messenger, right. I control you. Here's what I'm saying. Stay tuned. We're, we're going to learn more in Revelation 4 and in Revelation 5 and 6 and 7. And, and, and we're going to continue to be stretched as we look at prayers that are offered on earth and, and the effect, the, the, uh, the aftershock, if you will, that is felt in heaven and the way that those are registered around the throne of God. This is meant to get our attention and cause awe and wonder and worship and humility in our hearts, right? And, and just think about the fact that even though these words are nearly 2,000 years old, here we are even this evening talking about it, and, and we're still left in, in wonder of what is being revealed in this revelation to John. We're going to run across the designation six more times. Just continue to think about that. We'll return to it, I, I assure you. For right now, let's get into the message. Revelation 2 and verse 2. This one who is communicating to the church in Ephesus says, I know. We spent a good amount of time Sunday morning talking about how he is... And he knows, right? He is intimately acquainted, as has already been brought out, with who we are and who the church is. He says, I know your works. I know your toil. I know your patient endurance. If you were going to encapsulate that in your own words, what would you say? What, what is he communicating? This glorified son of God. Alan? The spell of the place they're living in. Okay. It's 
He knows where they are. We'll, we'll notice some references to that, to, to the way that different cities were, especially very difficult cities in which to live. What else? Craig? Uh, in general, this is describing someone who is, in some sense, they're, they're working hard and very patiently with the things that need to be done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's work, and then there's toil. Right? There, there is work maybe that you do one day and then there is toil that you do for a week or a month or a year. Th these are people who are doing things, right? And they're con they haven't stopped doing things. David, what were you going to bring up? I was going to say that this is almost like a progress report. Okay. So, so, you know, here's some good things that you're doing and here's something that you need to tighten up on. Okay. You know, and, I mean, we're familiar with that approach, but it's balanced. I mean, when he says, I know, I mean, you're talking about God. Right. He knows everything. Nothing can be hidden from him, right? That's going to come through loud and clear over the next couple of chapters. I know your works. I know your toil. I know your patient endurance. I know how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. What does it mean if you cannot bear with someone? Alex? So I did talk about here. First thing, in First Corinthians, Paul talked about how the Corinthians were buried with someone who was Okay. Living in a very evil manner. Mm -hmm. uh, so that they're doing the opposite of that. They are saying, here is sin, and we can not see it. But then also in the latter part, I get the idea from Galatians where Paul is talking about test the spirits, and here are people that not only cannot bear evil, but are testing to make sure what's coming out is actually in fact good. Okay. Michelle, go ahead. I think that hearing something was tolerance for something. All right. And we're being taught to be tolerant now for some things that are sinful. Sure. But we're told not to be tolerant toward. The cardinal sin in 21st century America is the sin of intolerance. Right? Why would anyone claim to have been an apostle in Ephesus? What's that all about? Why would anyone do that? Well, isn't that what he's talking about in the chapter of the first I read in 28 about the overseers who <clears throat> we know that Paul had foretold dark days ahead even from among those who were overseeing the church in yeah. Ephesus this, this part here is through the church and that's he's writing this from. same group of people that's right David well you, you touched on it earlier but in Acts 19 when, when Paul uh, was casting out and demons, they were Jewish exorcists, and they started, you know, exercising in the name of Jesus. Right. I mean, so there, there was some some seeds there of people that were looking for praise of men, or you know, some type of attention equivalent to what Paul was doing. Okay. Craig, and then Zippy. Just a certain level of, of power and um, authority associated with the title that was known among the churches at that time. So okay. Anyone claiming to be that might have an influence then with what direction someone was going to go. All right. Yeah, I pretty much agree with what they were saying. I heard one other thing that was rather interesting too. There were some that were within the groups that would purposely mislead in order to possibly push back the spread of Christianity and other okay. to, to, to bring people to disbelief. Oftentimes this has been brought out for personal gain, right? And we understand even though it's been centuries, there are still those who claim to be exalted messengers of God for their own personal gain, right? We see that all over the place. This is not a, a new phenomenon. It is not a phenomenon that came to a close at this point in time. Those in Ephesus 
They, they won't put up with it. Alex has brought up testing the spirits, right? Uh, there has been an inspired letter that has been written to these people. In fact, there have been many letters now that have circulated all over this area. There have been those in person who have proclaimed the gospel with the help of the Holy Spirit. There is inspired literature, and we can compare the fruits and, and the credentials of people and not bear with anyone who would claim to be someone that they are not. You have found them to be false. He says in verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. We, we got a flavor for what it was like to live in Ephesus. During the days of Paul, we don't have any reason to believe that got easier, right? Especially based on what we talked about last week with some of the historical background of all of this. And so how is it, if we view this as kind of a progress report, pretty good so far, right? A lot of good things that are said there. And so the question is, how can a church be doing all of that? And get those sort of commendations and then be told this. But I have this against you. That you have abandoned the love you had at first. What does it look like and sound like and feel like if a church is still working and toiling and patiently enduring and not bearing with those who are evil, testing those and finding them to be false, enduring patiently, bearing up for the name of Jesus, not weary, but having abandoned the love they had at first. Mark, what is that? Simply put it, they lost their passion. Okay, they lost their passion. We have, we have a couple that just met and getting to know one another, and uh, there's a certain amount of growth and a relationship, mm -hmm. and we see it so many times that get married, have some kids, and that passion, that connection they have together with one another just seems like this is a lot, and we still go through the effort. Uh, uh -huh. you know, like, Going through the motions is a, a common phrase, right? This was the church that got the formative letter about Christ as the bridegroom, the church as the bride, right? Loving as Christ loves the church. That was this church that got that letter. But something now has gone very, very, very wrong. Several hands went up. Zippy and then... It's like, it's it's like the politicians we send to Washington, you know? Okay. You know, they go there with the most awesome intentions to, to, to support the people, and then all of a sudden, the big machine corrupts because the, okay. the being in front of front of man and all that all, all that you know, perception that they're doing it, and it's the you lose sight of it's God. It's yeah. about God. It's all about God. It's always about God. Yeah. It's not about me. They lose focus. It's like hmm, maybe it's about me. Yeah. Easy to forget who I am and who I'm serving and what this is all about. David? I'm reminded of John 4, verse 24, when it talks about worship. Mm -hmm. Worship and spirit and truth. So I think they did have passion around not tolerating false teaching and false apostles and the Nicolaitans and, and all of that. But I don't think they were doing it with the right attitude. Okay. And so the, the danger here is that they're going to lose their influence to win people over. If all they see is people that are, you know, not loving, you know, you want to speak the truth and love. Okay. They're speaking the truth, but I don't think they have the right attitude. That phrase also comes from Ephesians, right? Speaking the truth in love. Love first and foremost for God. Love for my neighbor as myself. Alex? What they said. It comes out of motives. You can do all the right things, but you don't have the right motives. Okay. A great example of this chicken in the one thing is to be hospitable, as many apostles as Jesus commanded, 
It's another thing to go all the way up to Jesus and serve on the mount and walk by me. Okay. Those are two very different things. Being hospitable is fulfilling the letter of the law, but actually loving your neighbor as yourself is fulfilling the intent of the spirit. It's brought out loud and clear in the minor prophets. It's brought out in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, it's very easy for us as Christians. As we read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and we read Matthew 23, and we look at these hypocritical Jews, right, who were going through a lot of motions, but straining gnats and swallowing camels and doing things in order to be seen by men. And it's very easy and natural for us as we read that to look down on those short-sighted Jews. Well, it's not just a Jewish problem, is it? It's a human problem. Problem. Alan? And then we're going to verse. God so loved the world, they gave you the only begotten son, who could have been the son, to have something like that. Uh, God may ask you the question, what have you, what have you done for me? What have you done for Jesus? And what have you done for yourself to get you to heaven? What Andrew talked about, we don't understand all the spirit. We don't know how it works. They had they could do miracles in all the other apostles. A lot we don't understand. But we can understand when Christ died on the cross. Mm -hmm. That's very plain. What have you done? Okay. And not only what have I done, but what is the condition of my heart? Right? Ruby? To <clears throat> me, it sounds like that they had lost their zeal. Like okay. when when you were first became a member or you know, obeyed, how excited you were, how enthusiastic you were, and how much you wanted to help everybody about this great sacrifice that Christ did for mm -hmm. you. And so they're probably tangled up with trying to straighten and people thinking out and so instead of going back to the first. Okay. And you that. How is the love that we have at first abandoned? How does that happen? What what is that? It comes through teeth. Okay. I uh, I brush my teeth. Not because I love to brush my teeth, but because that's the right thing to do, and that's what I do, and I do it. My daughter loves to brush her teeth. It's exciting. It's fun. So, starts out, this is what we do because we love to do it. Mm -hmm. For them, it became a routine. This is what we do because this is what we do. Okay. Great. Well, was that, what he was just saying there, becomes a faith of duty rather than a conviction of the heart. So, it really comes okay. down to the heart a lot that we can learn here, Vanessa. Go ahead. Take it back to what they said. I think sometimes we do a routine and no longer I want to please God. Mm -hmm. you know, I want to. I want to make my father happy. The love is. You know, I want to do what my father wants. Right. I want to make him be happy or proud. Okay. Ruby brought up the idea of, of going back to the first things. That's right out of Revelation two and verse five. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. How, how serious is this? He says, if not, I will come to you. Remember, he is pictured as standing among these lampstands. I will come to you if you will not repent and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. We get the idea. It's not too late to turn this around, right? But they are headed in a drastically dangerous direction. And if this does not get 
turned around. We, we've noted in Old Testament history how God would get to the point where he said, enough is enough, right? We've got that vivid picture of the Spirit of God leaving the temple in uh, the book of Ezekiel because people simply will not repent. And if God is not the, the center of all of this, if this is not about God and, and God is not involved in what we're doing, if really this has already been brought up, this is just all about us, then what is the point in view of what we've already learned from the book of Revelation? Monty, go ahead. And uh, to, to uh, further that thought that you're having, uh, we have to put the we are. Like we said, this is not a, a problem that is extinct, right? We know what it is to grow complacent, to grow cold, to, to, to be very routine and take things for granted. Such a stark warning from the very beginning. Paul? It kind of reminds me of an old adage that if it's not broke, don't fix it. I think sometimes if we become a Christian, as Ruby said, you have all the zeal, and you want to do everything that's right, and your love's there. Your love's there because you want to do it. You want to try to save everyone you come in contact with through the blood of Christ, yep. and you want to do that so heartily that you think, boy, I'm not doing a really good job. You start beating up on yourself. You beat your head against the wall, and you think, I'm just not doing something right, so I'm going to fix it, and it's not broken. It's like everybody said, it's you and you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You have to understand how to, to take your feet with and stay firm. Go back to the foundation of everything, right? Lord willing, this Sunday we're going to continue uh, where we were last Sunday morning and try and make this very personal, try and make it practical for ourselves, for our purposes. This evening we'll just read the last two verses. Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We know scarcely a little about uh, these people. They will show up again in, in just a few verses, and we'll talk a little bit more about them. It is very clear that God hated the works of these people that would lead people away from the truth. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, for the one who conquers and grants eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Much more to come. I appreciate you being here tonight. If you'd like to talk more about this, I'd love to do that with you. Thank you for being here.